We are all aware in some form of the impact that intoxicants have on modern society. There are often tight laws prohibiting the use of certain drugs and abundant use is considered unseemly and to impair your judgement. The way in which intoxicants affect behaviour has led to their exclusion from professional workplaces where important decisions are being made. However, in different times and places in history, it was not always the case. War and instability has led to some unusual social norms that you may not generally see in peace times. War and instability carved figures like Hitler, Stalin and Churchill, men who dictated the course of human history. There is a hidden side to history that is not often talked about due to its dubious nature. The question of how many influential people of history were under the influence of intoxicants. If they consumed a large amount and often, how much did it affect their decision making? My question is then this. Was Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill under the influence of an excessive quantity of intoxicants to the point where it was affecting their decision making during World War II? The nature of the question is difficult to answer, since much of the information is absent. Much of this behaviour is generally done behind closed doors, leading to much of the information being presented as hearsay. The goal is with the limited and contradictory information available, to gain some insight into the nature of these men through the means of their addiction or usage of intoxicants. Men who dictated the course of the world are still being reflected in today's society. Hitler and Drugs by the time World War II began, Germany already had a liberal drug policy. The Great War had left its mark on Germany, and the wounded soldiers' acute pain was dealt with with opiates. Germany in previous decades had expanded their pharmaceutical industrial capacity due to military prompting. The top seller in the German market was the methamphetamine Pervitin, known as Speed or Crystal Meth today. Spiegel describes meth as the ideal war drug. It was accepted into the military for its effects of Heightened self-confidence, increased alertness, disregard for one's safety, resistance to hunger, pain or sleep, and euphoria. The two negative consequences were addiction and poor military capacity, which in Germany was more often ascribed to inherent weakness or disposition instead of methamphetamine itself. However, by 1941 this opinion had changed and German officials reclassified pervitin as a dangerously addictive narcotic. Before this shift in ideologies, there was a great demand for the drug. German soldiers called it tank chocolate or pilot salt, and it was often put in coffee due to the sparsity of sugar. It proved to be a great morale booster and was called the miracle pill by British newspapers. Impressed, the Allies experimented with the drug, calling it Benzedrine. Ow! Who put the Benzedrine in Mrs. Murphy's old teeth? Which the soldiers adapted to pet pills. By D Day, the Allies were selling a staggering amount of Benzedrine. While the Germans had stopped larger military distribution, US Marines and paratroopers were given pet pills on D Day to help motivate their incursion. The Normandy landings took Hitler off guard. He was sleeping heavily at the Eagle's Nest, and it was said that his high officials did not have the courage to wake him. Some historians theorize that he was unable to be woken due to the powerful sedatives that he had taken as a sleeping aid. By this stage in Hitler's career, it was reasonable to assume that he was using drugs of some kind. Hitler was constantly concerned with his health to the point of neurosis. He had trouble sleeping and his meals consisted of a simple vegetarian diet that often left him weak. His abstinence from meat and alcohol was part of his anti-hedonistic thinking that left him pure. Once he remarked to a dentist, You see, doctor, how little my instructive influence has on those around me. I am the leader and yet I am the only vegetarian, non-smoker and non-drinker. This seems to be contradicted by his large medical chest full of sedatives and stimulants that he believed offered the miracle cure for his illnesses. Hitler once said, I cannot live without my doctor. This doctor was Professor Theodore Morell, who supplied and injected Hitler with his supplements. He was a fast rising star in the Nazi elite, much to the dismay of fellow doctors and pharmacists who found him inept. However, Hitler included him into his personal entourage as he was performing wonders as far as Hitler was concerned. Later, under American interrogation, Morel stated, Actually, Hitler was never sick. This leads to two points. That Hitler's diet and sleep issues led him to over-exaggerate his illness, which resulted in regular and narcotic consumption for relief. Secondly, that when discussing Hitler, the information we have is considered sketchy. The latter is sometimes referred to as the Hitler problem. It prescribes that any meaningful psychoanalyst into Hitler should be approached with caution. Nazis captured and interrogated after the war gave horrible reviews of Hitler, partly because it was what the Allies wanted. Villainizing Hitler needed to be thorough. 
Furthermore, the lack of childhood and wartime information makes him a difficult person to analyse. So through the haze of misinformation and no information, a personal Hitler is difficult to understand, and therefore so are his motivations in a completely accurate portrayal. With the information available, it is said that Hitler received 82 different drugs between 1936 and 1945. He began taking supplements to improve his medical nutrition and to regulate sleep. Hitler's hypochondriac nature allowed Morel to exercise great influence with the Nazi leader, prescribing him medications for illnesses, both real and imaginary. One of Hitler's attending physicians reported, Morel more and more took the treatment by injection so that the patient immediately felt better, and this type of treatment seemed to impress Hitler. Whenever he felt a cold coming on, he would have three or six injections daily. If Hitler had a speech to deliver on a cold or rainy day, he would have the injections the day before, the day of the speech, and the day after. The normal resistance of the body was thus gradually replaced by an artificial medium. Granted, many of these cocktails were harmless and often placebos, though there are occasions recorded, under interrogation circumstances, of blatant strong usage. One such instance was two days after a failed assassination attempt on Hitler, codenamed Operation Valkyrie. Complaining of a terrible pain in the forehead, Dr. Geisling administered a cocaine solution, which quickly relaxed Hitler into near slumber. Geisling reports that he felt the compulsion to mercifully kill the Fuhrer with a cocaine overdose, but fear prevented him. If the story is true, then, in this instance, Hitler's drug-induced stupor certainly left him open to death. However, this was after injuries sustained due to an attempt on his life and does not imply an addiction to cocaine. There is much controversy over the legitimacy of Hitler's methamphetamine addiction. Some believe it to be the Fuhrer's favourite drug. However, Norman Ola believes it should be treated as rumour. He says that Hitler was certainly addicted to an excessive number of drugs, not just methamphetamines. Upon studying Morel's records, Ola found that Hitler was mostly addicted to Yukodal, a combination of animal hormones and a strong opiate similar to heroin. This gave him the feeling of invulnerability, as recorded when his generals repeatedly told him that, we need to change our tactics, we need to end this, we're going to lose the war. He didn't want to hear this. Dr. Morel gave him the drugs that made him feel invulnerable and on top of the situation. Hitler's mental descent is generally attributed to megalomania. He had gone mad with power. However, in Hitler's case, perhaps drug addiction was the major factor. Side effects associated with methamphetamine psychosis and opioid addiction mirrors those of Hitler's late mental and physical state, which includes paranoia, delusions, and shaking. Historians generally believe that Hitler suffered from Parkinson's disease. Towards his later life, he's often shown holding his left hand to hide his shaking. It might be possible that he was showing one of the signs of drug abuse. Hitler's deteriorating health during the war horrified many of his party members, and though he suffered from no organic disease, he became a physical wreck. By the end of the war, he was moving further and further away from public life. Measures were taken to hide his physical weaknesses, such as him rarely being seen with glasses. In a culture that expected such a high level of performance, is it not surprising that performance-enhancing drugs were used? In a culture where drugs had been easily available, especially to soldiers during World War I, in which Hitler fought, you could see how addiction could have begun. While we cannot truly know Hitler's drug intake level, it can be assumed that at some point during World War II, the drugs he was injecting were altering his decision-making ability. Stalin. One of Hitler's biggest decisions was to invade the Soviet Union. Stalin thought he had guaranteed Hitler's trust and the Soviet Union would be beyond reproach. However, Hitler had other plans and attacked his ally, codenamed Operation Barbosa. As legend goes, Stalin retreated into his dasha and went on a week-long bender. Theories as to why Stalin went on this alcoholic binge range from him being deeply hurt by Hitler's betrayal, concern over the lack of Soviet leadership and soldiers due to his massacres, or he expected to be shot by his own men for the lack of foresight. Either way, witnesses like Nikita Khrushchev state that at the beginning of the German invasion, Stalin took up heavy drinking in isolation. This left the Soviet Union leaderless at the beginning of the war. If this story is true, you could definitely say that Stalin's drinking affected lives at some point during World War II. When he emerged, he reinstated the vodka ration and 28 million men were given a glass of vodka a day till the end of the war. This seems an odd practice when most of other countries were cutting back their alcohol production. It is commonly known that Stalin liked to drink, but was it to the point where it was greatly affecting his decision-making ability throughout the war? The previous example may be an isolated or rare incident, although it is said that his drinking increased during World War II. 
when historians and psychologists examine the question of Stalin's alcohol addiction, a few points are generally raised. Firstly, that his father was an alcoholic. In Stalin's case, it could be said that the apple never falls far from the tree. Like his father, he cared little for his family by the end, treated women harshly, beat people to break their will, and drank. The Russians were famous for their large banquets. There were often large drinking parties full of Russian male elites. According to some of their reports, Stalin often made homosexual gestures towards them while under the influence. One such example was making male government officials dance with each other while he watched in the corner with the gramophone. Official Jacob Berman commented on the instance. Berman. Yes, it was pleasant, but with an inattention. Toranska. You didn't really have fun? Berman. Stalin really had fun. Hitler by this stage had conducted homosexual purges within his own government. Stalin, wanting to be friendly with Hitler, and perhaps from the pressure of his own government, devised of a homosexual conspiracy. This imaginary political concept had Stalin investigating possible homosexual corruption within the Soviet government. This looked from the outset to be a pact between Hitler and Stalin to show that they shared ideologies. Stalin may have found this disgusting or instituted it himself. Either way, his homosexual tendencies during drinking parties could have been just the kind of thing to aggravate Hitler. This is a small point, but it shows two things. First, that at times Stalin drank heavily. Second, that he behaved in a different manner than his sober self and it affected those around him. When the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin, met at Yalta in February of 1944, it has been said it was the high point of relations between these countries. Although when Stalin first met Churchill, it did not go well. After two days of heated negotiations, Sir Alec Cadogan, who accompanied Churchill, reported a change of mood. And I quote, I found Winston and Stalin and Molotov who had joined them, sitting with a heavily laden board between them, food of all kinds crowned with a suckling pig and innumerable bottles. What Stalin made me drink seemed pretty savage. Winston, who at the time was complaining of a slight headache, seemed wisely to be confining himself to a comparatively innocuous, epivescent Caucasian red wine. Everyone seemed to be as merry as a marriage bell. You could say that Stalin and Churchill's love of food and alcohol brought them to reasonable speaking terms, at least during the war. Men who despised each other at this point were giving each other gifts, including large quantities of alcohol for personal use. It could be said that alcohol was not a bonding factor for Churchill and Roosevelt. Historian Nigel Hamilton states that Churchill was against the D-Day landings for various reasons. However, Hamilton believes that through the haze of whiskies, Winston may have been neglecting Roosevelt and the Combined Chiefs' advice during the planning. If this is the case, then alcohol could be said to be affecting him, amongst other things. Winston Churchill is a well-renowned drinker. In the early years during the Boer Wars, he was promoted to Chamberlain and sailed on the Dantiar Castle. For the ship's journey, Churchill had a personal stockpile of 60 bottles of alcohol. It has been described of Churchill that he did not drink as much as people think, but it was still regular. Alcohol was something constant in Churchill's life. He actually had some disdain for those who took sobriety breaks, finding terrible results in intemperate self-restraint. Many say that he made alcohol work for him instead of the reverse, developing a high metabolism that kept his head relatively clear. There were times of high intake, one notable example from when he was Secretary of State between the winters of 1921 and 1922. During this period, he frequently dined, danced, and drank with English nobility to a noteworthy extent. In a sense, though, this helped Churchill meet many prominent figures and future correspondents. It could be said that his good grooming and alcohol tolerance helped him in such situations. Though there are instances where alcohol began to take his toll on him. He had spouts of depression, especially from 1931 to 1935, where he felt politically impotent. These are what he calls his black dog periods and he is thought to have been drinking heavier. During this period, he met Lord Rothmere, who bet him £2,000 that he could not give up alcohol for a year, to which Churchill replied, life would not be worth living. He had a drinking pattern. He would wake up, have some whiskey and soda with breakfast, then drank all day, every day. He was a sipper, not a guzzler, but still this was a large amount of alcohol to be consuming daily. Professor Kimball once said, no alcoholic could drink that much. One point of disagreement may be the doctor's note that Churchill was given while in America during Prohibition. This allowed him to drink unlimitedly in a country where it was illegal to drink due to a doctor's orders that it was necessary. 
In one instance during World War II, Churchill had stayed up late drawing up military orders and drinking. When the chief of staff read it the next day, he commented to the staff, Winston must have been quite tight when he dictated these. Tight meaning drunk. In a similar instance, Field Marshal Lord Allenbrook found himself having to check Churchill's orders for mistakes. However, here is where Churchill differs from Hitler and Stalin. He was not a dictator. There were measures in place to make sure he did not have too much power, but he did have influence. He once said, Haven't you heard yet that I put something more than whiskey into my speeches? In this sense, Churchill's main function was an orator, and the drinking, while affecting him, may have actually helped him. It was when he was making military decisions that he was drinking was a problem. Luckily, this rarely became an issue. Due to his previous military blunders pre-World War II, he did not dictate the final word of military action. Conclusion Could you imagine our modern leaders embracing this level of consumption all day, every day? Yet these men did not live that long ago. If you start to take into account some of the unusual decisions in history, intoxication or addiction is rarely cited. If you ask the question, was Hitler's pseudo incendiary a result of drugs? How many Russians died because Stalin was off on a depression bender? If Churchill was constantly drinking, how much did this affect his behavior and affect those around him? To travel in time and give a breathalyzer or a drug test to some of history's greatest figures would probably clear up some vexing questions. How much of history in our modern world has been made up of intoxicated decisions? <laughs>